I've never been as emotionally attached to Star Wars as others seem to be. Sure, I love the original trilogy. It's great. The original Star Wars is a timeless classic, and The Empire Strikes Back is one of the best sequels to ever be produced. Even Return of the Jedi, with all of its faults, has some great character work and one hell of a final act. But beyond that... Eh... I enjoy Revenge of the Sith. It has its moments, and the final battle with Anakin and Obi-Wan is pretty good, but I'm not exactly invested in it since the prior two movies were kinda... Tell us now! It was a bounty hunter cause. Terrible? They were just terrible. When I first saw The Phantom Menace, even as a kid, I recognized pretty quickly that the franchise had run its course, and Attack of the Clones did a pretty good job at solidifying that position. Sure, every now and then we might get something great. Revenge of the Sith and Rogue One at least had moments of brilliance, but I was and still am pretty certain that it's never going to get any better than the OT. I mean, I never thought it would get this bad, but I'm not losing sleep over it either. That is, so long as I'm not listening to EFAP. The Force Unleashed, however, is in its own sort of dimension. There is so much about this game that just does not work, but I'd be lying if I said it wasn't a total blast to revisit, even with all of its problems. I think the key difference for me with the early 2000s era of Star Wars and Disney Star Wars is the attitudes in their approach. Star Wars nowadays is so damn cynical and factory produced that I can't even enjoy it as a schlocky action flick. Gareth Edwards at least seemed like he was excited and really cared about making Rogue One the best film it could be, and I can certainly appreciate it despite its faults. The production value goes really well with the more gritty, warlike presentation, and it felt like a refreshing change of pace for the franchise that could have had a bigger and better influence were it not overshadowed by how a abysmal The Last Jedi was. Though, let's be clear, it wasn't just The Last Jedi. All of the sequels, and Solo, are fucking garbage. Shameless exploitation of women and people of color as shields against criticism, this obnoxious persistence to subvert expectations rather than actually tell a meaningful and coherent story, the complete lack of respect for the classic films that made these money-making abominations possible to begin with, it's just so bitter that I can't even stomach it like I with some junk food. Oh, and I guess it's worth saying, uh, the Disney Plus shows are also fucking terrible. Sure, The Force Awakens at least tried to show a degree of reverence for the originals, but let's not pretend the writing and world building didn't completely shit all over them also. Having beautiful, drawn-out shots of classic iconography is great, but I would much prefer not completely undoing what the originals work to achieve for the sake of telling the exact same story, but with less interesting characters. But even with all of the problems in the prequels, the extended universe, and so on, you can tell that there were honest attempts being made to expand and flesh out the universe in meaningful ways. Not that I don't think the folks at Disney weren't trying to do something, but unlike Disney Star Wars, the prequel era media felt like it was being made with a genuine creative interest and a desire to satisfy fans of the Star Wars universe. You know, the people who legitimately cared about it and wanted it to succeed. Yeah, those toxic fucking assholes. Yeah, yeah, those people. Fuck those people, am I right? Fuck you for making us money. Fucking pieces of shit. And hey, that kind of attitude goes a long way with art and media. Even if something turns out to be shit, it can develop a cult following so long as the people behind the work aren't dumbasses and antagonize the fans. I mean, in some cases, certain media will anyways, but eh, whatever. People love the prequels for this very reason. I don't know anyone who's trying to argue that they're actually good films, thank god, but I know plenty of people who still love them regardless. The Force Unleashed is another exemplar of why I believe this kind of attitude is so important. George Lucas was directly involved in the making of this game, and it's abundantly clear in the interviews with the developers that they wanted to go all out in making this the most kick-ass piece of Star Wars media out there. They really cared about not just making sure that playing as Darth Vader's apprentice lived up to the hype, but that they didn't betray the original works either. The team behind this game had a very clear and transparent passion for Star Wars, and that's exactly the kind of people that should be hired for the continued and extended production of such a beloved franchise. The reason I want to make that clear right off the bat is because even though 
though this game has a ton of issues, I still respect it and what the team behind it was trying to accomplish. That doesn't negate or excuse the issues with the game, believe me, we will get to those, but it makes the product so much easier to consume and enjoy knowing how much love was put into it by the studio and even George Lucas himself. The Force Unleashed is definitely one of those stories that's got a strong premise but suffers from a lacking execution. The story revolves around a man named Galen Merrick, codenamed Starkiller, that Darth Vader took as an apprentice so that he could one day overthrow Palpatine. After all, Sith always betray Sith once succumbed to a lust for power. The prologue sees Darth Vader hunting a rogue Jedi that he's tracked to Kashyyyk sometime after the instigation of Order 66. After slaughtering probably a hundred or so Wookiees, Jader- Jader? Who the fuck is Jader? Vader kills the Jedi, but then discovers that the Jedi has a son, our protagonist, who has a natural acclamation to the Force. to put it mildly. Vader then takes the child under his wing, or cape, as an apprentice and trains him for the next couple of decades. Part of the appeal to me with the Force Unleashed is seeing more of the Sith. Star Wars is surprisingly lacking with content when it comes to exploring the Sith and what they do beyond their interactions with the main characters. Sure, the prequels centered around Palpatine turning Anakin to the dark side, but that was after the Sith, and before the Empire had been properly established. Beyond that, the Empire just kind of menacingly exists, and the Sith do just about the exact same, but in legend. Um, actually, in the comics- Yeah, 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 I don't care. While I do think it's cool that we got a Star Wars adventure from the perspective of the Sith, I'd be lying if I said that this gave us a more layered understanding of the goings-on of the Empire, or that it even does a good job at humanizing the Sith. There's definitely an intrigue from the game regarding the relationship between Vader and Palpatine, but it doesn't really go anywhere, and it kind of takes the focus off of Starkiller, despite the game supposedly being about him and Vader. This wouldn't really be a problem, except the game is way too short not to be focusing on Starkiller. Starkiller's characterization is honestly pretty disappointing given the potential. Him being torn between the light and dark is genuinely compelling as an idea given the very premise of his character, but the surrounding material just doesn't support his internal conflict as well as it probably should. Starkiller's in a very unique position in regards to the philosophy of the Jedi versus the Sith, in large part due to the prequels. Jedi are supposed to be closed off to their emotions, showing remarkable restraint and discipline whereas the Sith are prone to their emotions, impulsive, and disregard principles for ultimately selfish goals. But Darth Vader needs Starkiller to keep his emotions in check and trust in Vader by principle, whereas Starkiller's love interest Juno pushes him to do what's morally right, betray Vader's disciplines, and help kickstart the rebellion. This could have also been great for fleshing out why the dark side of the Force is so compelling. I mean, Okay, we obviously know why it's compelling. Abilities, unnatural, you, you know the meme. We also have Anakin succumbing to the dark side in the prequels, but that was due to the manipulation of Palpatine, where it was much more of a road to hell scenario. But why was Palpatine so seduced by the dark side that he'd kill his master Darth Plagueis the Wise? Why was Darth Plagueis so seduced by the dark side? Why was Darth Maul? Did Maul plan to kill Palpatine? I'm not saying this game needs to answer those questions, but some kind of understanding as to why Starkiller would be so compelled by it would have been a great way to flesh out his character. The game itself is marketed as having to choose between the two sides of the Force, so why not explore Starkiller's relationship with the Force itself beyond his relationship with the Sith? Perhaps Starkiller's trauma compels him to find a sort of security in the power of the dark side which he can't fully comprehend without Vader's guidance, thus adding to his internal conflict and putting him in a fundamentally awkward position that he doesn't 
doesn't know how to get out of, or if he even can at all. Maybe Starkiller actually fears the dark side and that's lending to his distrust of Vader. Or perhaps he fears the light side of the Force due to the fate of the Jedi that he's come to understand through both his childhood encounter with Vader as well as his hunting down of the Jedi. This could then develop as he establishes the Rebellion under Vader's command and begins to find that hope that the Rebellion clings to, thus granting him the security that he once found in the dark side and thus adding a greater sense of weight to the decision of whether or not to kill Vader in the finale of the game. Vader once being a Jedi could also play a factor into Starkiller's judgment. There is so much that could have been explored here, but we never get a proper conversation between Starkiller and any other character that goes beyond, hey are you sure you can trust Vader? The answer won't surprise you. Ever. Unfortunately, Starkiller's relationship with Vader is a bit of a clusterfuck, and his relationship with Juno is nowhere near as fleshed out as it should have been either. Throughout The Force Unleashed, Starkiller is assured by Vader on multiple occasions that the two of them can overthrow the Emperor together, but Vader's actions indicate that Starkiller is merely a disposable pawn in Vader's schemes, and once his usefulness is no longer there, Vader will dispose of him at a moment's notice. The crux of the issue is that we don't fully understand the relationship between Vader and Stark Killer, so Starkiller's indecisiveness isn't really all that sympathetic. Vader protects Galen from being executed as a boy, but then we jump ahead many years and the story goes along as if it just expects us to know the full depth of their relationship and why these moments between them should be so impactful. But that's not really how writing works. Look, I get it. It's the Sith. Brainwashing, manipulation, deceit. They practically have a patent for it. But surely there's more to this than just blind loyalty. These two have known each other for a very long time now, and Vader has raised him from boyhood into adulthood. Vader tells Starkiller repeatedly to have faith, to trust in him, and continue following orders. But why does Starkiller feel so compelled to do so despite the actions of Vader seeming so dissonant from what he's saying? We simply don't know. All we can say for certain is that Vader is Starkiller's master and they've known each other for a very very long time. That's just not enough. I'm sorry game, but I'm not some idiot fanboy who's willing to fill in all the holes for myself. I don't indulge in media so that I can do the writing for it most of the time. Then we have Juno, Starkiller's newest Imperial pilot. Initially, Starkiller is closed off, which is to be expected. There have been many other pilots before her, and it's pretty safe to assume that Starkiller hasn't been taught much in the ways of basic social etiquette under the tutelage of Darth Vader especially given that Vader has been raising this child in absolute secrecy from the Empire among the Empire. It's not like he had friends on a playground to go hang out with on a daily basis. Juno and Starkiller have zero chemistry, and she comes off as a pretty low-effort attempt at a love interest. It's predictable from the moment they meet, and it's not as if Juno gets much screen time anyways. I don't even think it would be that reductive to call her a plot device, because I couldn't really tell you anything about her as a person, and her characterization is really conflicted despite her lack of development. On one hand, we're supposed to believe that Juno is one of the best pilots in the entirety of the Empire. Otherwise, why would Darth Vader recruit her to pilot the Rogue Shadow on these top secret missions that would ensure his overthrowing of the Emperor? She's even shown to be quite proud of this. But after Vader attacks Starkiller, Juno's allegiance is completely flipped on its head and she spends the remainder of the game pushing Starkiller to abandon the dark side and abandon the Empire. Bear in mind, Vader attacking Starkiller occurs after only the third mission, which is chronologically not long after Juno meets Starkiller. Despite having only a few minutes of screen time across the entirety of the game, Juno goes from being a diehard loyalist to the Empire and Darth Vader to assisting Starkiller with abandoning Vader before even the halfway point of the game. And that's not even taking her relationship, or lack thereof, with Starkiller into account. When she first meets Starkiller, he's closed off, strictly professional, and an outright ass. But after a handful of conversations where regarding their missions, suddenly they're so in love that they're willing to abandon the dark side and start a rebellion against the Empire. How in the name of Jar Jar did we get here? The best written relationship in the game is easily between Starkiller and Proxy, but even it has problems more so regarding the logistics of their professional relationship than their interpersonal chemistry. Proxy is a hollow droid prototype designed by Darth Vader for the sole purpose of killing Starkiller. The idea is that Starkiller should be ready and capable at all times to defend himself. It's a 
pretty cool idea and it fits the concept of a Sith apprentice like a glove. Proxy and Starkiller's relationship is immediately endearing, with Proxy's introduction showing him taking the form of Obi-Wan Kenobi in an attempt to assassinate Starkiller. Starkiller immediately counters Proxy but doesn't destroy the droid, conveying that this training protocol requires Proxy to remain alive so as to allow for the maintained testing of Starkiller's self-preservation. This means that Starkiller not only needs to be able to overpower Proxy, but also defeat him with enough skill to subdue the droid without completely destroying it, which Starkiller is obviously very capable of doing. I mean, sure, he could destroy Proxy, but doing so also means that Vader has to create another Proxy, which costs resources and would eventually be noticed by the Emperor. That isn't stated outright, but it can be safely inferred. What makes the relationship here so endearing, though, is the dialogue, with Proxy complimenting Starkiller's successful attempts at surviving and Starkiller's own casual acknowledgement of their dynamic. I don't even know if I can think of another dynamic like this in fiction, let alone Star Wars. At least not that I'm aware of. It's just really endearing. In a darkly comedic kind of way. Unfortunately, the logistics of this entire concept fall apart more and more as the story progresses. Proxy's entire reason for existing, as far as we know, is to eliminate Starkiller. We're not given any further elaboration regarding his protocol, but we can assume that there is little in the ways of restrictions to Proxy's protocol, given our understanding of Darth Vader and how unlikely he is to show any degree of mercy to his one and only apprentice. That being said, it would also be pretty stupid of Darth Vader to not include some kind of protocol to prevent Proxy from becoming a danger to Starkiller's missions, as doing so would foil Vader's attempts to overthrow Palpatine. But we'll get to that soon enough. As far as we can tell, this artificial intelligence only exists to eliminate Starkiller. So why, I ask, does Proxy pass on so many opportunities to eliminate Starkiller throughout the game? There are so many instances where Starkiller is completely vulnerable to a lethal attack from Proxy, and yet Proxy only seems capable of initiating a battle when Starkiller is most ready and capable of defending himself. This is antithetical to the very reason that this droid exists. Like, Proxy. My guy, Starkiller doesn't have his lightsaber, he's literally within arm's reach. Why haven't you killed him? What are you waiting for, you fucking moron? You're a robot! Impale his torso! Even when Vader informs Starkiller that he's ready to take Vader's side against Palpatine, Proxy says that he'll continue his protocol regardless of the fact that Starkiller's training is complete. That's fine, it makes sense as to why the droid built for one purpose would continue to pursue that purpose beyond the given reason for it, but why the fuck is Proxy permitted to attack Starkiller during his missions? It's safe to assume that Vader has contingencies in the event that Starkiller dies while in active duty, but we don't know what those contingencies are. Yes, the likelihood that Starkiller would ever die at the hands of stormtroopers or fucking Jawas is practically non-existent, but that's still more likely than an outright impossibility. If Starkiller dies, Vader being able to keep Palpatine from learning about Starkiller's existence is going to be almost impossible to assure. So yes, we can assume that Vader has contingencies in place. After all, the very act of conspiring against Palpatine was a massive risk from the start. But in what galaxy would anyone with a mind as sharp as Darth fucking Vader consider it reasonable to increase the likelihood of this multiple decade conspiracy coming to light? But it doesn't stop there. So towards the end of the game, Starkiller is sent to Raxus Prime in order to dispatch of an Imperial Star Destroyer. This is to simultaneously instill hope in the Rebellion that they stand a chance against the Empire while providing a distraction for the Emperor to focus on while Vader and Starkiller attempt their coup. That's a smart plan there, Mr. Vader. Now, why of all of the missions that this could have happened is Proxy permitted to carry out an attack on Starkiller? And not only that, but he's been saving the hollow form of Darth fucking Maul for a scenario like this? Now don't get me wrong, as far as shallow fan service goes, this is fucking awesome. This was long before Disney's pathetic attempts to jangle the keys for hollow cheers of diehard Star Wars fans, so for this game to suddenly pull out a bit of shameless fan service in Darth Maul, complete with the Duel of Fates OST in what was the first Star Wars game with pretty good lightsaber combat, is legitimately one of the coolest moments in a video game. See, there's no one inside you that I haven't already defeated. Give me some credit, Master. I have one module you've never seen. An enemy I've stalled for years.
This kind of thing was rare back in the day. Unfortunately, it's where this moment takes place within the narrative that makes no sense whatsoever. Proxy seems to be the most loyal he's ever been to Starkiller. In fact, it's not long after this duel that Proxy will risk his own being to save Starkiller from Darth Vader himself. Now, droid sentience is sort of its own issue in the world of Star Wars, and I'd rather not start on a thesis regarding artificial intelligence and theories of sentience and sapience and free will in Star Wars, but what I can can say for certain is that Proxy's willingness to attack Starkiller at this particular moment in the story makes no fucking sense. Let's think about this both from the perspective of a Darth Vader loyalist and an aspiring rebel. In regards to assisting Invader's conspiracy to overthrow Palpatine, which one could assume is the rationale behind Proxy's prime directive, Starkiller's training is complete, and to endanger him here would seriously jeopardize- jeopardize? It would seriously jeopardize. And to endanger him here and now of all places and times would seriously jeopardize Vader's plans. If Proxy were to succeed, everything that Vader has been working to achieve since taking Galen under his wing almost two decades prior would completely fall apart. Being confident in Starkiller's abilities does not excuse jeopardizing your own plans. That is nonsense. From the perspective of an aspiring rebel, which Proxy could very well be leaning into given his friendship with Starkiller, killing the very catalyst of the rebellion before their hope has even been kindled seems like a pretty terrible idea. Now, it could be argued that having Starkiller face off against a Sith Lord, contrast to Proxy's taking on the form of Jedi like Obi-Wan at the beginning of the game, is indicative that Proxy himself believes that Starkiller could do with training against the Sith. It even makes sense that Starkiller would need training against a former Sith Lord so as to prepare him for the coming battle with Palpatine. That part works, but the issue still stands that this is not the time nor place to initiate that kind of protocol. Proxy is a really cool character, and his dialogue with Starkiller really does a good job at endearing the audience to both of them. But there is very little about his programming that makes any kind of sense, and I don't know if I can recall a single moment that Proxy was on screen, which didn't cause me to scratch my head. And speaking of head scratchers, at one point in the game, Starkiller returns to Kashyyyk looking for Princess Leia under the instructions of Rom Koda. We'll get to him in a moment. What I really wanted to highlight here is the appearance of the Force Ghost of Starkiller father. Oh boy, where do we even begin with this? During Starkiller's mission, he feels compelled to enter a broken down old home, which just so happens to be his childhood home before Darth Vader ruined it. Not only is it convenient for this particular moment to occur that Starkiller's mission took him here, of all places that he could have come to on this planet, but it's also pretty convenient that Imperial forces, despite laying siege to this particular area, happen to leave this structure standing and leave it alone long enough for Star Killer to do his thing. Now, I'm not saying this ruins the story. It's not too stupid. In fact, I'm pretty forgiving of it. It's not exactly a plot point that completely alters the course of the game's events. It's just a quiet character moment for Galen, which I think is fine to concoct a bit of contrivance for. Upon arriving at his old home, Starkiller begins to feel a sense of nostalgia and melancholy, and it's then that his father's Force ghost appears, saying that he never wanted any of this for Galen and apologizing for allowing it to happen. This could have been an incredible character moment for both both Galen and his father were given a moment to breathe, but this cutscene is barely over a minute long and has no consequence for the plot or even Galen as a character. Like, did Kento not think it worthwhile to have a sit down with his son? There is so much to explore here, not the least of which is the very concept of the Force Ghost, but nothing happens. The Force Ghost is a concept that's been bastardized more and more as time has gone on, and the exact mechanics of them have slowly gone from vague and mysterious to utterly nonsensical each and every time they've come up. Even the DLC of the Force Unleashed muddles things, and it's only canon to a specific ending of this already non-canonical game. 
Nothing in this moment is detrimental to the story of the Force Unleashed, let alone Star Wars as a whole, at least not as far as the mechanics of the Force Ghost are concerned. This is actually pretty consistent with how the OT handled Force Ghosts, which is more than I can say for the appearance of Force Ghosts in most other Star Wars media. Looking at you, sequel trilogy. Kento being Starkiller's father makes it entirely believable that he would be so in tune with the Force that he'd be able to generate a Force Ghost. The problem, however, is that he only has a single line of dialogue, then proceeds to fuck off into oblivion, never to return. Mist Potential doesn't even begin to describe how fucked this is. Just imagine, for a moment, the discussions that these characters could have had, the depth that this scene could have added to future events regarding Galen, the answers that could have been given regarding Force Ghosts, the possibilities with this scene were fucking limitless, and they did nothing with it. Immediately, I imagine Galen and potentially learning how to project a force ghost himself, and how well that could have lended to a sequel following the events of the DLC for this game, which revolve around the dark side path of the base game. Fucking imagine a dark side converted Luke Skywalker betraying Starkiller and taking his place at Palpatine's side as his newest apprentice, only for the ghost of Galen to train alongside his father and Rom Coda to redeem himself by helping to kill Palpatine and bring Luke back to the light. Imagine just how valuable a conversation with Kento about the values of the Jedi and the Sith could have been for Starkiller's development. Maybe this talk could have been what steered Starkiller from his potential character trait of fearing the light side that I alluded to earlier. Starkiller could retort that it was the light which failed his father in his fight with Vader, just as it did countless other Jedi both before and after him, to which Kento could reference the dark side being what led to Vader's subservience to Palpatine to begin with, as well as Galen's subservience to Vader. This could then spark an entire discussion about whether or not submission is a preferable alternative to potential loss. Or how about a discussion of the meaning of betrayal amongst the Sith and how Starkiller could resolve to escape the trap that he's been brought into. Think about it, if Starkiller betrays Vader, then he becomes Palpatine's next servant, at which point he's likely to attempt what Vader himself was aspiring for in his own betrayal of Palpatine, a possibility that the Hoth DLC even alludes to when Starkiller takes Luke as an apprentice. Hell, if we look ahead to the sequels, Luke could then betray Starkiller, becoming Palpatine's next puppet, then take Rey as an apprentice in an attempt to overthrow Palpatine, and so on and so on. I realize this is looking way ahead of when the writers of this game were working, but it is kind of cool to think about. But if Vader succeeds in overthrowing Palpatine, what's to stop Starkiller from betraying Vader now that such a deep mistrust has been formed between them? Starkiller is trapped. There is likely no happy ending regardless of what he does and this moment could have addressed just that. Again, there were so many possibilities and yet all we got was Kento saying, I'm sorry, I didn't want things to go this way. No elaboration, no development, Nothing. Just a tease as to what could have but ultimately did not happen. This game's narrative has a lot of problems, but I don't think any of them managed to actually piss me off like this one does. There's one more issue that I have with this scene that I've only briefly alluded to, and that's Rom Coda. Starkiller is warned by Coda to turn back. He claims that Starkiller is not yet ready for what lies ahead. When Starkiller asks what's inside, Coda says, How should I know? My link to the Force has been cut. I'm sorry, what? Why the fuck would you claim that Starkiller isn't ready to face what's inside, only to admit that you don't even know what's inside? That doesn't... make any sense. Why the fuck are you like this, script? Also, Rom Coda's been disconnected from the Force following his battle with Starkiller, which left him blinded. I mean, it also saw Coda falling from a space station into a planet, but uh, I don't think I really need to address why that doesn't make sense. But also, you can become disconnected from the Force? There's a link? Uh, uh I'm sorry? How the fuck does that work? Well, Loveless, in the comics, don't you fucking dare. Anyways, how the fuck does one's connection from the Force become severed? Look, I'm not about to pretend that the Force makes any goddamn sense, especially after the prequels and especially after the sequels, but there is so much about this that I just do not understand, and I have seen all of the movies that this game is meant to tie into multiple times and played the Force Unleashed multiple times. How in the world does one become disconnected from the Force? 
Why didn't Obi-Wan's link to the Force break following the events of Revenge of the Sith? How does this e how does this work? Do the midichlorians just fuck off if you lose to a Sith? Why didn't this happen to Luke following his defeat at the hands of Vader? Does this happen to the Sith also? If we're to assume that the Force has a conscience and chose to disconnect from Rom Coda, why doesn't the Force just balance the light and dark by severing the links of extremely powerful Force users that throw off the balance, like Palpatine? Why was wasn't Kento's link to the Force broken following his defeat by Vader, and how is he able to project a Force ghost? How in the fuck does any of this work? Coda saw a vision of Starkiller becoming his pupil prior to his defeat, which certainly means that Coda knew what would happen. If the Force itself was relaying this information to him, consciously or not, then why in the bloody hell did the Force disconnect from Rom Coda? There is so much about this one tiny detail that makes zero goddamn sense, and it's because of shit like this that people still have no fucking idea how the Force works nearly half a century after the first film was released oh my god what the fuck game you are drunk this script is drunk all right so at this point some of you are undoubtedly wondering how is it that i claim to love this game despite all the issues that i've been addressing and despite the very title of this video yes it's a bit clickbaity leave me alone well dear viewer if i'm being perfectly honest this game appeals very strongly to what i'm simply going to refer to as my monkey brain i really really love utterly absurd displays of power it's part of why i find such enjoyment in products like godzilla dragon ball gurren Lagon, devil may cry god of war and of course star wars the Force Unleashed. Now, that's not to say that I don't enjoy smaller scale fights. For example, one of my favorite fights in all of fiction is Tarzan versus Clayton. But I'd be lying if I told you that seeing Godzilla go thermo fucking nuclear on King Ghidorah in IMAX wasn't one of the coolest fucking things that I've ever seen in my life. The Shotengen Topa Gurren Lagan Giga Drill Break is probably the most ridiculous fucking thing that I have ever seen. And I love it so fucking much. Goku versus Frieza on the dying planet Namek where they're literally just punching continent-sized energy balls into other planets to blow them up is still the undisputed coolest fight in fiction. Don't even at me. Like God of War, you know, before it got neutered, The Force Unleashed is exactly what the title tells you that it's going to be. You are unleashing the Force. You are probably the single most powerful Force user to ever exist. And now you have the ability to unleash that power on an almost helpless opposition that stands before you. Lightsaber techniques that send enemies flying. Wait, weren't they supposed to like cut throwing helpless enemies into TIE fighters so hard that they actually explode, fucking force lightning, grounding a fucking star destroyer. Starkiller has a level of power that has still yet to be wielded by any other character in the mainline Star Wars canon. Some might hear this and think, wow, that sounds almost like a certain Mary Sue from another canon. However, you would be quite mistaken. Galen Merrick has all the power in the world, yes. But, he's ultimately powerless to escape the grasp of the Sith. Starkiller is fully capable of besting Darth Vader in combat, but Palpatine is still fully capable of doing whatever he pleases with the Apprentice regardless of the path that he chooses to follow. Should Galen side with the light, Palpatine will kill him the moment that he hesitates. All that power, but too weak to use it. The first rebels manage to escape, but it's at the cost of Galen's life, at which point his family crest is made into the symbol of the rebellion so as to honor his legacy. Should Starkiller align with the dark, Palpatine, anticipating his betrayal, will attack him in his weakened state, following the fight with Vader, killing the rebels and destroying the rogue shadow as well as its pilot, Starkiller's love. Following this defeat, Starkiller is reconstructed into the Sith assassin that would act as the successor to Darth Vader, destined to serve Palpatine until there is no longer a use for his skills. There really is no happy ending for Starkiller. Either he dies a hero, or he lives long enough to see himself become the villain. A reluctant and tortured villain at that. And this is exactly why it takes more than unlimited power to be classified as a Mary Sue or Gary Stu. Now, I'll be the first to say that the gameplay of The Force Unleashed, well, let's just say it's not Devil May Cry 5. 
The camera is downright horrendous at times, the abundance of quick time events hamper combat, the controls are often very wonky, especially when it comes to using force levitation, and the game is utterly riddled with bugs and performance issues, at least on PS3. That being said, I would only go as far as to call the gameplay, as the title would suggest, subpar. Locking on at least helps to mitigate the issues with the camera. Quick time events, while bad, don't exactly ruin the game, and they're at least used consistently so you generally don't end up in a sequence feeling too out of nowhere. The controls are definitely awkward, mainly with the button layout, but they are fairly consistent once you get the hang of them. And performance issues, I would at least assume, are less frequent on PC, which will undoubtedly become the most popular platform for this game to be played on as time goes on. Now, let me be clear, this is not not an attempt to hand wave the issues that I've just pointed out, I'm simply saying that they are manageable within reason. These issues generally aren't that bad barring certain, particularly egregious fuck-ups. For example, the bugs are bad, yes, but the only time it got out of control and became a serious detriment to my experience was during my playthrough of the first DLC, where a room in the Jedi Temple literally wouldn't spawn. Like, the entire room wouldn't spawn. This was fucking horrible, and it wasn't until I went online that I figured out how I could proceed. On the whole, though, the gameplay is decent. Nothing exceptional, but there's definitely fun to be had once you get past these issues. I think part of what made it so enjoyable was the level of challenge being presented. My first playthrough was on the standard difficulty, and there were times where I was getting my ass handed to me. Every now and then I'd get a cheap death because of the camera going crazy or something, but generally speaking, my deaths were my own faults. I do think that falling into pits being an outright death is lame, and should have just respawned the player with a chunk of health being taken out, but... Eh... I'll be nice, and I'll let it slide. Actually, no, fuck you, that shit's stupid. The Force Unleashed is absolutely a power trip given all of Starkiller's abilities, but it also makes it a point to ensure that power trip is well earned through its challenge and relatively fair balancing. There are loads of abilities to unlock. You can customize your lightsaber, you can purchase various upgrades, but ultimately you will need to learn the game inside and out if you want to conquer it, especially on higher difficulties. You want to be Darth Vader's apprentice? Earn it. You want to be a Sith Master? Earn it. It's not the most complicated set of mechanics in the world, sure, but the game is fairly competent at playing to its strengths. Force abilities are naturally quite overpowered given that most enemies, barring bosses, don't have access to anything remotely in that league. So the game limits your use of these abilities with a universal cooldown, which forces, <laughs> forces you to be tactful in how you execute these various techniques. Not only that, but no force power is game-breakingly powerful. Force lightning is great for stunning groups of enemies, eliminating shields and dealing damage over time, but it also slows Starkiller's movement and the damage it deals is pretty minuscule without upgrades. The Force Push is similarly not very powerful until you've acquired all of its upgrades, but even then you can't just spam it for unlimited insta-kills. The Force Grip is powerful and can be used pretty creatively, but it also immobilizes Starkiller and tightens the camera's focus. Plus, it only works on smaller enemies and certain objects in the environment. Similarly, the lightsaber can deal a lot of damage, but slashes with it need to be executed with relatively high proficiency, as it does leave Starkiller pretty vulnerable and is only effective at close range. Which is especially important to note, since most enemies have some form of ranged attacks. The range issue is of course barring the lightsaber toss, but you still have to dedicate to it and it can leave you pretty vulnerable at times. Again, all the tools at the player's disposal are quite powerful, but using them effectively requires a fair amount of proficiency. The greatest warriors aren't just those who possess power, but those who know how to wield it with great skill. And in no way is the earning your power trip design philosophy better exemplified than through the boss fights. Boss battles in Star Wars The Force Unleashed are fucking great. Definitely not perfect, Shakti's boss arena in particular is honestly kinda pissed, but even then her fight is pretty damn good. These bosses do not fuck around, and they often utilize many of the abilities that the player has at their own disposal, be that using the force or wielding a lightsaber. In order to conquer each boss, you're going to have to understand their behaviors, how best to counter their force abilities, and when to strike with your saber. Each and every technique at your disposal has a purpose for helping to take each boss down. And figuring out how 
how best to execute each ability in a given scenario is crucial for overcoming these foes, and all of these lessons carry over thanks to the bosses using relatively consistent abilities across the board. After all, most of these bosses are either a Jedi or a Sith. There's also a healthy variety between boss movesets to ensure that even though similar skills are being put to the test, there's not much in the ways of repetition, at least for the most part. It also helps that the input feedback regarding Starkiller's various attacks is really damn satisfying. Lightsaber strikes are an auditory wet dream and have this really visceral crunch when they connect with an enemy. And the way enemies utterly crumble under Starkiller's force push, as well as the grip, is impactful to the point of utter brutality. Now, satisfying input feedback, even at the highest level, doesn't mean much on its own, but combine that with the relatively high skill floor of this game's combat, and what you ultimately end up with is a game that feels really damn satisfying to get good at. Sure, brain get happy chemicals, but when each and every strike feels earned due to the skill in which I've executed my attacks, and the feedback is this satisfying, my monkey brain do become the big gay. And I know I ragged on this earlier for making no sense in the context of the story, and let's be clear, it doesn't. God damn is the fight with Proxy Mall one of the best in the game. The camera could certainly be better, and the checkpoint of the fight being set right before the unskippable phase 2 cutscene where Proxy finally turns into Maul is fucking stupid, but I'm willing to let those ultimately minor issues slide when the fight is this good. This fight kicked my ass at first. And initially, I'm gonna be honest, I found it really frustrating. Again, primarily due to the poor placement of the checkpoint, and the camera not exactly being very helpful all the time. And to be honest, I was also kind of tired at the time, so I was a bit less tolerable. But holy hell, when I began to apply the skills that I'd picked up throughout my adventure, and began steadily improving with each and every attempt, everything about the fight just clicked. Dodging Maul's lightsaber tosses, perfectly countering his force abilities, consistently blocking his lightsaber combos, and landing those strikes from my own lightsaber felt so fucking good. Eventually I'd become far too much for Proxy to handle, and the Duel of Fates OST perfectly complemented the exceptional skill in which I'd managed to defeat him with. The fight was epic in every sense of the word. If there is one part of this game that is going to stick with me, it is undoubtedly the duel with Proxy Maul. A genuinely fucking excellent boss fight. The Force Unleashed has its problems, both in the gameplay and in the narrative. Certain tertiary and narrative elements could certainly have done with more polish, but holy hell, when things fall into place, the experience is genuinely unlike any other, and it unironically makes you feel like a Jedi or Sith Master. There we go, I did it, I said the thing, I'm officially a game journalist, uh, IGN, please hire me, Star Wars The Force Unleashed is a 9 out of 10, and Starkiller is just teeming with the exaggerated swagger of an orphan bastard. No, but in all seriousness, it's probably closer on an objective scale to a 4. Subjectively though, 7 out of 10. Really enjoy it despite its flaws. The narrative though, oh god no. Star Wars The Force Unleashed is a game that I do hold quite a bit of love for, and I'd be lying if I said that it didn't feel weird making a video basically taking a game that I really like apart, but this video also feels very healthy in a way. I think being sincere about the faults in media and art that you love is genuinely important, especially as a critic. I've expressed in the past that this is an attitude I wish more people, especially critics, would adopt, so I figured that with this game I had a pretty decent chance at practicing what I preach. So, would I recommend Star Wars The Force Unleashed to someone who hasn't played it before? If you have an interest in Star Wars or character action style games, then I can honestly say yes, I do recommend it. For those of you watching this video, I assume that you have at least a passing interest in one of these two things. As a Star Wars product, it offers a very unique kind of story, at the very least with its premise, and it's just really damn cool to see not only how insane force powers can get, but just how damn good they can feel to use for yourself. As a character action game, there's really nothing else like it. The force powers are very unique as a mechanic, and are used pretty effectively as both a combative tool as well as a puzzle solver. Combat in general is pretty solid barring the occasional cameratism, and boss fights are, for the most part, the highlight of the game. Some cases, they're genuinely exceptional. Force Unleashed really is a product of its time. Like the prequels, there was a clear and creative passion that I feel pours through in the final product despite all of its problems. 
It's for similar reasons that I, and I imagine so many others, get so much enjoyment out of titles like Revenge of the Sith. Sure, the movie's a hot fucking mess, but god damn does it have its moments of brilliance. I do apologize if this video came off as a bit more rambly than my usual content, but nevertheless I hope that you enjoyed it and found something of value to take away from it. This has been one hell of a year for this channel and myself personally, and it fills me with joy to get to share this time in spirit with each and every one of you. If you did enjoy this video and are finding my channel to be one worth revisiting and sharing with others, I'd also like to invite you to my Discord server, where I and fellow longboy enthusiasts discuss media, share memes, and so on and so forth. Take care. May the Force be with you. There we go. I did it. I, I officially said the Star Wars thing. I'm one of those fucking guys who said, may the Force be with you, unironically. Jesus fucking Christ.